I'm Hashim Kutsi, co-founder of Liwa Capital Advisors and managing partner. Inflation award forgotten by many of us is today very much on our mind. And inflation link bonds, the most liquid instrument that tracks actually inflation link bonds is a, not a new innovation. It's been around for a long period of time. And uh, it's an instrument that I think people should learn learn, learn, learn about if they don't already know, know it and, and see how it can help in managing their savings. Joining me in this conversation is Dan Bernstein. Dan is the authority on the subject by the sheer fact that he's, he really started the research on that back in the early 90s when he was at Bridgewater. He's currently an advisor to uh, Bridgewater, but he really sort of did the research uh, and then helped the US Treasury and French Tresor in starting their inflation bond program. Then, good having you here. It's, it, uh, and, and seeing you after a long period of time, uh, and I think you know that the the uh, I couldn't have picked in my mind a, a better person to speak about inflation link bond because uh, you worked on their design and then for 20 years no inflation taking place so the, these instruments made it to to uh, institutional portfolios but never got the attention and now uh, perhaps you know their time ha has come to do what they were supposed to do for portfolios. Leaving, of course, aside, you know, anybody who has a liability that's linked to inflation, these instruments fit very well in that place. What I would like, you know, to do is really uh, go back to the basics, which is how these instruments function as, a, as in, the, as in the, the basic concept that if I wanted to buy an inflation ring bond today, what am I getting over the life of this instrument? And of course, how, how is that different than buying a nominal bond? Okay, well, it's very nice to see you, Hashem, and thank you for having me. And um, you and I both worked together um, on uh, when a lot of the major countries issued inflation index bonds. And so, uh, and so we both had a lot of experience um, with these markets. Um, I, I think I would just start by saying that it's a, it's a somewhat of a quirk in our kind of financial world today that we're used to debt being paid in nominal terms and that we sort of have come to trust governments to pay back debts in currencies that they actually control the value of and can effectively default on by, by reducing the value of those currencies that they pay back in. in. And I would just note that if you go back a long period of time in, in, in history, it wasn't the norm. It, uh, investors didn't normally trust governments to pay back debts in currencies that they could control. And if you go back to early US history and history in many other countries, um, you will find um, bonds that were payable in, in, in real terms, in inflation adjusted terms. And sometimes that was bonds that were based on commodities prices. Uh, sometimes they were bonds that had uh, what was called a gold clause. There were various ways that it was done, um, but it's a unique um, feature of the sort of last 50 years or so, uh, 50, 60 years, that we've become used to bonds not being paid that way. And so now, now uh, uh, when we talk about inflation index bonds, um, you know, they seem like they are the, uh, the, the outlier, but actually they are more consistent with way, the way debt was always issued um, going back. back. To answer your question, um, I think it's, it's simple to think about an inflation index bond as a government promising to pay you a fixed yield above inflation, whatever inflation may be. And so if you buy, let's say a 10 year inflation index bond, what the government that's issuing that bond is promising to do is pay you whatever the, the CPI inflation rate is plus a fixed um, yield above that. And so for example, if you buy an inflation index bond that has a 1% real yield and, um, and then over the next you know, 10 years, inflation comes in at 4%, they will add that 1% to the 4% inflation and pay you 
roughly uh, something like a 5% total return. And so it's a fairly um, simple um, idea. And, um, and the big difference between um, an inflation index bond and a nominal bond is that is that the government is absorbing the inflation risk. They are promising to pay you uh, above inflation. When you buy a nominal bond, it's the investor that has to absorb the inflation risk. And of course, if inflation goes down, when you own a nominal bond, um, uh, that can be a good thing. But uh, if inflation goes up, it's the investor that has to take the, uh, uh, take the loss of that. Um, I think I would also just mention that a couple quick things about inflation index bonds. One is that um, it's important to think of them as a separate asset class and not as a component of fixed income because their behavior is completely uh, unique and different from nominal bonds. They, they behave in ways that are, are totally different. And so to think of them as a separate asset class in the same way that one thinks about equities, bonds, commodities, variety of, of different assets. Uh, is important. And the other thing to uh, uh, remember with inflation index bonds is, is that they are quoted in terms of their real yields. So that when you go into the market and you buy or sell an inflation index bond, you're being quoted a real yield. Um, and that's because you, they can't quote you the nominal yield because nobody knows what the nominal yield will be. It depends on future inflation. Um, but real yields, of course, are always lower than nominal yields because they don't include inflation. Um, but of course, when you own an inflation index bond, you will get paid uh, whatever that inflation rate turns out to be in the future. So, uh, you know, so you said a couple of things here, which, which, which I want to kind of, you know, zoom into. The last point you said, and if we take today's pricing, you said, you know, that really, uh, the, the real yields are always lower than the, the, the nominal yield because the nominal yield has the inflation in it currently, whereas the real yield will give you them whatever inflation is over the life of the, of, of the bond. So if we so in today's world, uh, the 10 year US real yield is let's say minus 0.9, let's, let's call it minus one. So the investor would be getting minus one plus the inflation rate, which let's say in today's world, again, let, let's say two and a half, which would bring him on par with what the current, in a way, the, the nominal yield is. But I guess, I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the difference here, which, which, you, which you know, you, you sort of highlighted is that when you buy the nominal, the nominal bond, you're taking the risk of inflation into the future. So, so, so if you if you're buying a U.S. ten-year bond yield at, at one and a half percent, the current yield, and if inflation turns out to be much higher than one and a half percent, which currently it is, then you know you 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 will end up losing money with a variation of stuff. In the inflation-linked bond. You will be you will be earning the inflation rate as it goes up, which 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 means you know although you will be starting with a minus one, but then when you add the current inflation rate, you go back to what the nominal yield is, and then as as the inflation rate goes up, your your yield will uh, your your total yield will go up with that on the on the investment, and so you know with this dynamic, uh, you know, uh, 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 with this dynamic, you know, one could always say then to himself, so then, you know, unless I think inflation is not going to go up or it will go down, I really want to buy inflation ring bonds. Why would I want to take the risk of inflation? Yes, exactly. And that, that was the point that I, I uh, was making earlier was that it's, it's not the norm that, you know, uh, when one uh, lends money, that one is is uh, always has to take the inflation risk of 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 that loan, and um, and that is something that is rel a relatively new phenomenon. It was much more typical when uh, when governments and other uh, private entities made 
uh, borrowed money that they had to that the borrower had to assume the inflation risk, and that's exactly what ILBs uh, do. Uh, and you're exactly right. The uh, today in the U.S., as an example, we have uh, roughly minus one percent real yield, um, but the nominal yield is about plus one point five percent, and so the difference between those two yields is what we call the break-even inflation rate. And, uh, and that is, is just a little bit under two and a half percent. And, and what that, that break-even inflation rate tells you is how much inflation would there have to be for an inflation uh, linked bond to have the same performance as a nominal bond over its life. And right now it's, it's just a little bit under two and a half percent. And, you know, we, we sort of think that's an interesting thing to think about right now because uh, in the U.S., as an example, um, the Fed has um, communicated that um, it wants to err on the side of inflation being above 2%. Um, and in fact, the Fed is targeting a uh, inflation rate called the PCE, which is a little bit different than the inflation rate in the in in that is paid on inflation index bonds, and if you factor in the different the difference between the inflation rate that the Fed targets and the CPI inflation rate that is paid on inflation index bonds, it's roughly that the Fed is is targeting an inflation rate that is that is roughly equal to where the break even inflation rate is today. So we we can look at at U.S. Um, ILBs, and the Fed is is sort of promising to hold inflation at least at the level of where uh, of where that break even inflation rate is today. And what we know is if they if they err on the side of of it being even higher, and we get even more inflation, inflation index bonds will outperform nominal bonds. And and there's really no limit to how much they could outperform nominal bonds. It's only a question of how high inflation could go in the future. And so, yeah, again, you know, the, the, uh, you know, just to, you know, to kind of to, 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 to go back to the basics is that, you know, one is investing $100 in that bond. The whole principle is going to be indexed to inflation, as in, as in you know, if, if inflation turns out to be, let's say, to the extreme, at the ten percent, then that that principle will will, will grow by ten percent. Whereas in the nominal bond case, which is currently it's not even cov covering inflation, you are really sure you will really run all that risk. So let me now ask you now the the, the question. Uh, so 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 the government decision. And I remember that debate back back in the late '90s, when you know uh, a lot of banks were advising the Treasury against issuing inflation ring bond because they, they did not see the cost savings in that. And and the question I have for you here is that so now why you know <clears throat> I mean why why would want the why would the government want to issue now inflation ring bond to take that risk if the if the Fed is almost kind of trying to put a put as in guaranteeing that inflation will be 2% at, at the minimum. Right, well, um, at the time that the, that the US first issued inflation index bonds, which was late 90s, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, worry about inflation at that time. And, um, and the, the US Treasury, um, was looking for a way to issue a security that might attract investors who weren't already buying nominal treasury bonds. And they thought that by issuing inflation, um, uh, by issuing ILBs, they might draw in a new kind of investor who was interested in an inflation protected investment. So their, I, the idea at the time was, let's just attract more investment dollars into US treasuries by issuing a, a wider variety of, of the type of securities. And I think at that time, um, nobody really thought of inflation as a real risk. Inflation had been falling for almost two decades at that point. Um, and in any case, inflation index bonds, even today, are still 
not a large percentage of the total issuance of, of treasury bonds and treasury bills. And so even if, if they did get more inflation than they expected, um, you know, most of their debt is denominated in nominal bond terms. Um, and probably their, their biggest inflation risk, if they were to have inflation, wouldn't come from the ILB market. It would come from the T-bill market um, where yields would you know, rise very quickly in an inflationary environment, uh, potentially. And that there's a lot more T-bills um, you know, in the market than there are uh, uh, US ILBs. A lot of the other countries that issued were issued along the same lines, the same idea of trying to um, uh, uh, tap a market that, that they hadn't tapped before and, and attract more investment dollars. And I think also there was this idea that I think they still have today, which is that with an aging population and you know, a baby, baby boomer sort of population that's aging, um, there was this idea that they would need to save uh, for retirement and they need more vehicles and more ways to, to, to do that effectively. And so ILBs you know, fit very nicely into that. And so now 20 years later, inflation is breaking out of the 2% range. And so these instruments really then become very handy for savers. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, now I don't know if they were, you know, issuing for the first time, if they would be as comfortable, you know, starting up a market that's going to cost them, cost them more, you know, in, in debt service with inflation going up. But, you know, they're, they're, they are very much of the mind that want, you know, that they are committed to the market. They don't want to sort of, you know, come into the market issue sometimes and then not issue others. They want to make it a, a sort of a regular, um, uh, supply of, of, of securities. And so they're, they're committed to, to continuing to do that as are most, most of the countries. And yeah, it's true. If we, if we were to get, you know, inflation above two, two and a half percent, it's going to cost them more on, on their debt. But as I say, I think, I think actually their, their bigger factor will be their short-term, you know, T-bills and short-term bonds that will probably, um, you know, in an inflationary environment, you know, that will be the bigger cost to them. So they're, they're, they're committed to doing it. And I think, you know, um, for investors, um, it's, it's, it's very important to think about because there are not very many investments um, that in, protect against inflation. Mo most do not. Then I want to go to the, to, to the overall portfolio now, since, you know, you, you've mentioned also at the beginning that it's a separate asset class and one should not look at it as a subset of uh, bonds. So how is the behavior of inflation-linked bond relative to other asset classes from a correlation and the drivers of its return? Right, well, um, there are basically two, to think about the behavior of inflation-linked -linked bonds, it's, it's, it's useful to break them down into their two pieces. And, and so their two pieces are the real yields and the inflation compensation components. And so let me just go through each of those and then that, that will, I think, lay some groundwork for understanding their performance. Um, the real yields of ILBs affect their value in an analogous way that nominal yields of nominal bonds do. That means, um, Inflation index bond prices are the inverse of their real yields, and um, and the longer that the 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 uh, maturity of the inflation index bond, the greater the sensitivity to real yields. Um, so inflation index bonds have a sensitivity to real yields, um, and while there are many things that can affect real yields, it's generally the case that economic growth is the biggest driver of real yields. Uh, and that's because real yields uh, reflect the, the tightness of money that's been engineered by central banks. Um, and, so, uh, and so typically what you see is that in an environment of strong economic growth, real yields get pressured higher um, and that hurts the value of, of ILBs. And in an environment of uh, low or, or weak economic growth, real yields um, get engineered lower and that increases the value of, the, of ILBs. So ILBs, because of their real yield sensitivity, are countercyclical. 
and they work in a way um, sort of opposite to equities, whereby uh, equities benefit from growth, ILBs are the opposite, equities are hurt by low growth, ILBs do, do well. So they are, um, for that reason, an, an excellent diversifier of equities. The other piece of, of ILBs, of course, is the inflation compensation component. And inflation is just accrued every day on an ILB. So every day that you own uh, an ILB, you get a little bit of inflation compensation. And, um, and over time, they accrue higher inflation when inflation goes up and lower inflation when inflation goes down. So the other aspect of ILBs is that, of course, they have a positive sensitivity to inflation uh, and they are you know, negative, negatively sensitive when inflation falls. Um, so, so ILBs, um, their sort of IL, ideal environment would be an environment of falling growth or low growth and rising inflation. And so you could almost think of a stagflation kind of environment as being sort of the ideal environment. And I think it's important to, to mention that because stagflation is precisely the environment that is particularly poor for equities. And you can go back to the 1970s and study that environment and see kind of how, you know, what would have diversified a, a portfolio, an environment like that, because equity performance was particularly poor in that kind of environment. Um, and, um, and ILB would be one of the, one of the best investments to div diversify. And so this is a really important point because most portfolios, most of our clients' portfolios, most portfolios around the world are dominated by equity risk. So that anything that can offset some of that equity risk and, 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 um, and give you uh, diversification against it becomes very, very valuable. Um, and, uh, and so ILBs do, do that quite nicely. And so how does that, uh, I mean, the, 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 the inflation component or the inflation protection is one angle that gold and commodities capture in a way. So how, how, the, how, how do the ILBs fit in that inflation protection complex? Well, if we think about commodities, um, they, of course, um, do very well when inflation rises, but they... Um, but they also are sensitive to growth and particularly industrial commodities uh, and, uh, and energy commodities and so on are sensitive to growth. And so if you get into an environment where, um, where you, you know, the best environment for a commodity type of investment would be rising inflation, but also strong growth. Um, and they, they won't perform quite as well if in an environment of, of rising inflation with weak growth. Uh, because of course, supply and demand for commodities is driven by uh, by economic growth. Um, so, so commodities, you know, they do diversify on the inflation front, but they don't diversify on the growth front um, in the same way that ILBs do. And so, uh, of course, we believe commodities are an important part of uh, of a portfolio as well. But they, but actually, inflation index bonds are really more counter cyclical um, than commodities and therefore do a better job of diversifying a, a portfolio dominated by equity risk than commodities do. And gold? So gold um, is, I think you can think of gold as more of a pure inflation um, play and obviously highly sensitive to inflation and to currency movements but not particularly sensitive to growth. So whereas commodities have a positive sensitivity to growth, gold is probably more of neutral to growth. And just you're just sort of isolating with gold the, the, inf the inflation sensitivity. And again, we think gold can play an important role in uh, a portfolio, but it does not give you the counter economic growth exposure that, uh, that, that an ILB would. So, you know, uh, so just to kind of digest, you know, I mean, the, 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 what, what each asset class does in a portfolio context, because this is also a reflective of the current allocation we have in the Liwa core portfolio, which, which allocates to the mix of Bridgewater strategies, is that, so long inflation linked bonds uh, protects you against stagflation. 
uh, it's long inflation, and and if there is uh, and if there is low growth or falling growth, it will do well. Commodities uh, protects you from an environment of rising growth. Uh, sorry, it captures rising growth and rising inflation. Whereas if there is falling growth and rising inflation, it does not do well. So, 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 so this fits that part of the box. And then gold, gold protects you against inflation, is neutral to the growth, high growth, low growth, and also acts as a currency. Okay. You, you know, the, 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 the other factor I would probably add about gold is, so gold now in the world of money printing to kickstart an economy actually is a hedge also to equities because if you're going to have a fall in equities, the, gov the governments will, will come and print money to shore up that, that market or the economy and naturally then gold would go up in this environment. Yes, um, I, th I think you said that very well and, uh, and that's exactly right. But you know, in an environment where there's money printing, um, there will be generalized inflation. And so that, that type of environment would be, would be good for both gold and ILBs. Um, and, um, uh, you know, gold has a little bit higher volatility than inflation index bonds. Inflation index bonds tend to be lower risk, lower volatility. They will do well in a rising inflation environment, but they, they don't have quite the volatility of gold. So gold has uh, sort of a high exposure to inflation um, you know, a dollar invested in gold is, you know, gives you a, a lot of exposure to, to, and a lot of protection against rising inflation. Um, but I, I do want to go back to and mention that what's interesting right now in the, in the world that we're in right now is that typically, um, the two investments that protect you against falling growth were ILBs and nominal bonds, that both, it, it tended to be the case that both real yields and nominal yields fell in an environment of, uh, of weak growth. And so those were the two investments that, you know, you wanted to have in your portfolio to protect you against a weak economic environment. But what's important to mention now is that with nominal bond yields being you know, not too far from zero and, and in some countries below zero, that they don't, they no longer have the ability to protect a portfolio against falling growth that they would have, let's say 10 years ago, because there's a limit to how much nominal bond yields could fall from where they are today. And that limits their ability to, to, to protect a portfolio uh, if growth were to go uh, if growth were to fall. And with and so the, what we think is in this current environment, inflation index bonds have become more important to protect against falling growth because nominal bonds are much more limited in their ability to, to, to do that going forward. Um, and so we, you know, we, for the part of the portfolio that protects against uh, falling growth, we, you know, we really have in, in inflation index bonds and now are playing a very important role in, in, in doing that. So, 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 so in simple English, you're saying that if there is a recession, inflation linked bond will appreciate in price more than uh, uh, government bonds that are trading close to zero or at zero. That's right. And if it were a recession where, let's say we're a deep one, you know, you, you would probably see nominal bond yields fall, but then they would hit some sort of limit of how far they could fall. We don't know exactly what that limit is, but um, but if if the recession were to be deep, um, there would be they would hit a limit of how far they could fall. And at that point, really, what would happen is nominal bond yields would stop moving. They would basically be pegged, and from that point forward, it would be only real yields that could continue to fall, and and that falling real yield is what would give you a, an, an appreciation, a price appreciation in an inflation and index bond investment. And the, and the nominal bonds will be pegged because of the inflation component. In other words, uh, 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 I mean, if inflation is going up, if inflation is going up, real yields can, can fall with, with no limit, whereas nominal bonds would have that limit. 
That's exactly right. In other words, the, the real yield, there's no limit to how low it can go because it's only limited by the degree to which inflation can be above nominal yields. And in a, in a if, we, if we were to go into a recession or a weak growth period, um, the central bank would engineer, they would, in order to stimulate the economy, they would likely engineer a higher, an inflation rate that were higher than the nominal bond yield as a way to incentivize people to borrow money and invest in the economy. And so they would literally engineer a, a low real yield. And there's no limit to um, how much inflation can be uh, above the nominal bond yield. And um, it's really can be as much as the central bank wants it to be. And the deeper the, the recession, the, the, the more they would engineer it that way. Um, so, so that's why uh, ILBs, I'm sort of saying ILBs in a particularly in a, in a prolonged or deep type of a weak growth environment would, would be a much better uh, protector of the portfolio um, than nominal bonds would. And that is exactly what one needs because in that type of environment, a, a deeper recession or longer recession is exactly the an environment where the equities would really suffer. So since we're talking about the risk of a, of a, of a, of a recession, although, although I think, I mean, you know, socially a, a pain of a recession would not be acceptable uh, uh, across, across the globe. I think, you know, governments will, will print money, but I'm just, uh, I wanna address the, 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 uh, the recession from the point of view of deflation. And as you know, you know, the, the the market now is divided between those who believe that there's going to be an inflation uh, and then those who think we are still in a deflationary trend. So how is the protection of inflation ring bond if we do actually get a minus CPI number? Okay, so in a deflationary environment, ILBs would obviously not be the investment one would want to hold um, in, a, in a deflationary environment. Um, you know, nominal bonds would be the would be the best performing asset class. Having said that, um, it's likely that inflation index bonds would per, would be better performing than equities in a deflationary environment. And deflationary environment would, is, is is incredibly destructive to a uh, equi to an equity uh, investment. Um, and um, I think it's worth mentioning that one reason why ILBs don't perform quite as poorly as one might think in a deflation is that built into ILB mechanics is something called principal protection. And this was a feature of the, of the bonds that governments built into it. And the way that it works um, is pretty basic. In the, in the US as an example, um, the treasury promises to repay either the inflation adjusted principal amount um, or the unadjusted amount, whichever is greater. So as an example, let's say that you, know, you, you invest $100 in an inflation index bond at issuance. The treasury is saying that they will index that $100 to CPI inflation, but if inflation is, goes negative and the, the indexation would take that value below $100, they promise to pay you a minimum of $100 at the end. So they've given a sort of floor on inflation um, in, in the way that they've designed the securities. Um, and that floor, um, you know, you, you might ask, well, why would they do that? Um, why would a government, you know, offer investors that? And, and the reason is, is that they don't think that deflation is a very likely outcome. Um, and they don't think they will have to ever pay on that. Um, and so they thought that it was, uh, it was a feature they could build into the bond that would attract investors, but it wouldn't necessarily cost them anything. And they're probably right about that because deflation is a very rare event. Um, one th you know, the, the major environment when we saw inflation was the 1930s. Um, and if there was one thing that became obvious after the 1930s, it was the destructiveness of, of deflation. And um, today, you know, central banks have the tools and they know how to use them to prevent deflation. 
And so we too uh, at Bridgewater don't think that there's very, it's a very likely environment, but, um, but that is how they work in a deflationary environment. So what you're describing here, you know, is it, it is a, as if like we've defined the rules of the game. So we, we, we've learned the, the, how bad deflation could be. So now, and we've learned how to deal with that through all of this physical. And also uh, we've seen how ugly inflation can be and we've learned how to deal with it. So the margin now is you're kind of like as if a mere reversion. So when inflation sort of, uh, when you get into a deflation, you have to print a lot of money and, uh, and socially uh, uh, deal with the issues that come with it until you push inflation higher up. And if it goes up to the other, other extreme side, then you, 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 you raise uh, rates to deal with. And I guess, you know, judging then from history, we seem to be now at that other side where inflation has been for 2% for 20 years. And there are the ingredients of that you would need to deal with economic slowdown and the social problems and what have you. So printing of money is the, is the way to deal, to, to, to deal with it, which, which again, I mean, you know, I, I, I go back to my initial question to you is that, you know, for a saver or for somebody who's managing saving through in a portfolio context, uh, inflation ring bonds ha really have a role in that portfolio. Yes, and I, I would add, Hashim, that if you're, if you're a central banker today and you're faced with the trade-off where, you know, if you don't um, uh, print enough money, you, you risk deflation, and if you print too much money, you risk inflation. And that is, to some extent, the, the world that they, they face today. Um, and you think about, OK, well, it's, it's, you know, central banking is a bit of an imprecise science. They don't always get it right. They have to err on one side or the other, usually. Um, and so I think what they probably think about is if you get it wrong and you have deflation, you, you can have a 1930s type of environment. And that type of environment is the worst possible. Uh, and the social cost and everything else associated with that is just completely unacceptable um, to pretty much everyone. Um, if you, on the other hand, get it wrong and you create too much inflation, you get more of a 1970s type of environment. And while nobody wants a 1970s environment, it was a far better environment than the 1930s. And so I think that, that central bankers today know that um, quite well and that what they've pretty much communicated um, to investors is that they're going to err on the side of, if they have to make that trade off, they're going to err on the side of allowing a little bit of inflation rather than risking deflation. And that's, and that's why we think ILBs um, uh, are a particularly important part of a portfolio today because the central banks are pretty much telling us um, they're going to err in that direction, whether, you know, how much and whether that will play out that way. Um, but investors need to have something in their portfolio that protects them if it, it were to go, it easily could. And, um, and there's really, um, you know, there's really not much in a portfolio that will protect the portfolio in that type of environment. And given the, the possibilities that are out there, it's a, it's a significant thing. So if we can broaden the me menu and say we can buy a liquids as in real, real estate. So the difference between real estate and inflation ring bond, leave aside of course the liquidity. What is in your opinion, you know, kind of the differentiating factor between the two? I mean, obviously real estate are real assets, something that you can touch, whereas there it's a, <laughs> it's a paper that promissory but that the government will pay you back. Uh, but the, the variables that, that, that move real estate that could be different from inflation bonds. Well, <clears throat> yeah, real estate often does get grouped in with real assets and, and sort of, you know, grouped with inflation index bonds, but it's really quite different. Um, there are two things that are different about real estate. Uh, one is that it's, it's clearly a pro-growth 
uh, investment. In other words, it'll do well if you have inflation coupled with strong growth. But if you have inflation coupled with weak growth, that's not a good environment for real estate, particularly if it's commercial real estate and you know, real estate that's associated with it, with the economic cycle. And so uh, that's one important distinction between real estate and ILBs. The other is that real estate investments by and large are, are very often leveraged and financed via debt. And so an environment, an inflationary environment, which you know, you might say, well, real estate is a real invest, is a is sort of a real asset, but it's a real asset that's financed with with debt. And when interest rates are rising, um, it's oftentimes not a great environment for real estate because because the cost of financing is is going up. And so, if you look back at, at real estate and its performance, um, it's certainly um, you know you'd certainly rather have a real estate investment, let's say then, uh, you know, an equity portfolio in a rising inflation environment, but it, it's not as protective as, as um, one would think, um, or one might think in a, in a rising inflation environment. And for that, re for all those reasons, it has a pretty strong positive correlation with equities. And so we, while we think real estate plays a role in a portfolio and does add diversification, um, it's not diversifying, it's not as diversifying to an equity portfolio um, for, for those reasons. Okay. So, you know, let me end with the, with the question that maybe sort of compare all of these asset classes in terms of what, what are they telling us? So in one extreme you have, or, or not an extreme, the reality is people tell you, why should I invest in a 10 year inflation linked bond when the real yield is minus one, obviously you earn whatever that inflation is to bring you up to the one and a half percent that the denominated bond is, is. But then by the same token, you know, people would tell you, why don't I invest in equities and I can earn a higher return on equities? So, so my question to you is that, you know, what is the, you know, what is the market telling us by pricing 10 year yields at minus one? Well, you know, I think, I think what you could sort of say is, well, the market is actually pricing nominal yields at about 1.5, about plus 1.5. Inflation today uh, is running above, as we all know. In fact, the year-on-year -year inflation rate in the U.S. right now is actually 5%. Um, and so... The, the reason for the negative real yield is simple. It's that inflation is running above nominal yields and is likely to continue to do that. Um, so really it's, it's, you know, when you think about the real yield, you have to think about where the nominal yield is and think about how they are valued vis-a-vis -vis each other. And that takes you back to this break-even inflation rate, which is the spread between the two. And the simple way that I would explain it is that with a break-even inflation rate of about 2.5% in the U.S. right now, any inflation above 2% is going to cause inflation index bonds to outperform nominal bonds. And of course, the opposite is true. Any inflation below 2.5% will cause nominal bonds to outperform inflation index bonds. But the way that um, I'd suggest one could look at that is that, you know, with a spread of 2.5% and the Fed sort of promising to you know, hit that number at least, there's not a lot of cost to owning an inflation index bond, particularly as a substitute for a nominal bond. Um, and you know, you're, not, not, you're not really paying any premium for it. It's interesting that we are kind of in a, a little bit of a rising inflation environment and there's not, it doesn't seem to be much of a premium price being attached to inflation index bonds uh, so far. So that one can buy an inflation index bond as a substitute for a nominal bond and then benefit if inflation comes in anywhere above two and a half percent. And on top of that, realize a better, uh, sort of a more, better diversification characteristics in their portfolio. So I think that's a good way to think about it is sort of, you know, 
you can you can own an inflation index bond as a substitute for nominal bonds. You have not a big there's really no penalty for doing that. And um, if you think inflation is going to be could be coming above two two and a half percent, there could be even a, a benefit from that. And then on top of that, you get the diversification um, and risk reduction um, um, characteristics that come with uh, ILBs. So I, you know, it's interesting that uh, that the market is pricing in that way. I think the market, by and large, is still sort of assuming that inflation will, you know, after a little bit of a bump following the pandemic, will sort of settle back, and maybe that'll be right. Um, but we we don't know, and we're not so sure about that. And so, if you extrapolate that thinking to equities, like like by the same token, you know, when people look at the minus one or the one and a half said, why should I invest in bonds? Let me go and invest in, in, in equities. But there is, there is a part of me that tells me, so that, that minus one, if you hold the instrument till maturity, and it turns out to be minus one, uh, what would that mean for other asset classes? Well, um, I think the first thing, first thing to say about that is that equities have always priced relative to interest rates. In other words, what, you know, the pricing and the yields on equities are not independent of um, interest rates. They always price themselves at some spread. And the fact that we have kind of low nominal yields and low real yields is part of the reason why we have equity prices where they are today. Um, so the equity market, um, you know, it, uh, of course, the, the outperformance of or underperformance of equities will depend on growth and how growth plays out. But, um, you know, with interest rates where they are, uh, uh, equities have already benefited from, from those low interest rates. If I think, you know, for equities, um, if we were to get into an environment where, you know, uh, you have rising inflation and rising nominal yields, um, there, there's going to have to be, you know, a little bit of a repricing of those, of those equity yields relative to nominal bond yields. And so, uh, you know, people oftentimes look at the real yields and sort of equity returns as separate things, but they really price themselves in relation to each other. And I think, you know, the, the, the issue is, is if, if yields are, are, are rising, um, it's going to have some impact on, on equity prices. And so you, I think you have to think about it more, more that way. We, we are in this environment of um, fairly low yields and that's affected the pricing of all assets, um, you know, fixed income assets, uh, equities, pretty much everything that, that prices itself relative to interest rates and, and relative to cash. So you're saying if, if bond prices have to drop to make them attractive for people to, to buy them, it's, it's going to affect the rest of the other asset classes. That's right. Dan, good catching up with you. Uh, uh, you know, you said something interesting that, you know, now people are not paying attention. I remember also when, when the uh, readings in the U.S. were around 4.3% in March 2000. Can you imagine, you know, like you're guaranteeing your returns at 4.3 and whatever the inflation turns out to be. And now, you know, it's, it's at, min at minus one. Yeah, it's another... It's another way of looking at and, and understanding that the market, you know, can get pricing very far off um, reality. I remember also when yields were above four percent, and it was at a time, I think during the dot com boom, um, when people really thought that they were going to get double digit real returns out of the equity market. And so at that time, a four percent real yield, you know. Yeah wasn't so attractive if you thought you were going to get, you know, 12 or 15% real yields out of equities. But that, that was the, that was the sort of mania a little bit during the dot com boom. And, um, and of course, if you go back in time, you go back 50 years, hundred years, equities, you know, in most countries delivered something like a 5% real return. And so here you had ILBs, you know, offering four, over 4% 4 that was locked in and guaranteed by the government. You didn't have to take any equity risk to get it. So you look back on that and think, well, that was pretty crazy. Um, and um, so anyway, it's just another way of, of looking at markets and 
understanding that they're, they're not always so efficient in the way that they price assets. Sure. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me, Hashim. All right.